What would the name of your punk band be? The Zubermensch. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, nice. Wow, you should start a punk band just for that. You can't just let this, this valuable resource go untapped. That's right. Only a band of think, Zubers. I don't <laughs> think it needs to be a punk band. It could be pretty much any, any band, maybe a dance troupe. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 34 of the iFreak Show. This week on our panel we have James Uber. Hello from Minneapolis. We also have Ben Sherman. Hello from Houston. We have Pete Hodgson. Cordial Seasons Greetings podcast listener. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. I'm also out there looking for some work so if you have, if you need custom backend Rails type stuff I'm good for that. I'm still learning iOS. Been a slow slog because I've been so busy with the other work. Anyway, uh, we also have a special guest, and that is Chris Adamson. Konnichiwa from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Awesome. You want to introduce yourself real quick for those who don't know who you are? Oh, sure. Hi. I'm Chris Adamson. I'm invalid name on Twitter and app.net and various other places. Co-author of a couple books on iOS and Mac development. I co-authored Learning Core Audio with uh, Kevin Avila. And that's available from Pearson. And that is a, a Mac and iOS book about the uh, low level audio frameworks on, uh, on iOS and OS 10. And, uh, also co-authored iOS SDK development with Bill Dutney. That's from Pragmatic Programmers. And whereas the core audio book is super, super, super advanced, the, uh, the, the Prags book is an introduction to iOS. And that's something that we've been updating, uh, Periodically, we had a first, you know, we, when, when iOS first came out, well, it was iPhone 3 at that point. We had this monster 600 page book and then we came back and said, that's too big. And we did just a, a true beginner's guide, which is our last edition for uh, iOS 6. And that was a, a much smaller book. And now we're still working on revving it for iOS 7. Now that uh, Bill is back at Apple and can no longer write books as a condition of his uh, employment at Apple, uh, this one's all on me. <laughs> Do you find that it's, I mean, obviously it's helpful to have like a partner in, in crime, so to speak, to write a book together, but in writing a book with a, another author, you also have to like be on the same page. Uh, yeah. And what always happens puns, is, but. yeah, what always happens is you, um, you know, if, if you trade off chapters, then there's always a challenge in making the voice consistent because the way right. I write is nothing like the way Bill writes. And we sort of have to rewrite each other to get anything that's even close to a consistent voice. Whereas on the, uh, the core audio book, Kevin and I basically said we're not going to write alternating chapters. We're both going to work on the whole thing all the way through, which led to a much more consistent tone, but it took us two years to write that book. So, right. you know, I, I, both of them have their hazards. I think it took me two years to read it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's useful information and incredibly important. And I, I'm not aware of any other resource that has uh, that level of deep detail all in one place anywhere. Uh, however, my practice of reading right before bed is not great for a book like that. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that. The topic was pretty difficult and it was a, you know, a huge learning curve for me as well because I had, you know, dipped my toes into, you know, as far deep as audio units, but I had to go a lot further for that. And then really the shocking thing is discovering that after that process of two years, realizing there's a bunch more I don't know, you know, I could go do another book that would be even deeper and scarier. I might be the only person who would buy it because at that point it's like, <laughs> Hey, let's all write IO kit drivers. It's like, uh, God, no. Uh, but. There's there's, there's going to be some hardcore there. nerds out there that would like it. You just have to charge a hundred dollars for the book. It might take it. I mean, the the thing with writing a nichey kind of book is always going to be that you know rather than if you write the thing that's all UI kit, you know everybody on iOS wants to get deeply into to UI kit. Everyone wants to know what's fancy things I can do with navigation, what's fancy things, things I can do with buttons. When you pick a specific small topic like media, like security, like a couple of other things. I, I would love to have a book on Accelerate Framework, but you know, you're going to sell to one out of every 500 potential developers, so it's going to be a much smaller audience. Although well, that hopefully audience- the longevity of those frameworks allows you to for that information to stay relevant for longer. Like you know, writing a book on on iOS, you've got a one year shelf life, and that's it, really, yeah. because iOS eight will come out, and nobody's going to buy an iOS six book two years after it's published. Exactly. And, and the, the lower level frameworks are consistent. You know, there's not that much different in core audio and, and they architected core audio in a way that they can add to it slowly over time um, without 
really even needing to introduce a lot of APIs because, you know, the way core audio generally grows is they don't add new functions, they add new properties. Um, so you can always say, you know, here's a new property that when you ask for an audio unit of this type, you're going to get this new thing. So basically what we can tell our readers is, you know, I know this book is two years old, but go look at the API diffs, just look in the header files, you're going to see what's new for this version, and you can handle the swing of it pretty easily. Easy being a relative term. It does strike me that something like the Accelerate Framework or some of these others where you said that it's not going to have as wide a reach might be a good option for an ebook where you self-publish it and then, you know, get the word out about it and maybe do it that way. And then you can make a few hundred dollars on it without, you know, all of the headache of going through a traditional publisher. When you say a few hundred dollars, I'm glad you've set your expectations appropriately for book writing in the technical (laughs) field. That is perfectly accurate. Well, um, uh, when, when I tallied up the hours I put in on Core Audio, I'm like, I would have made more money working at Taco Bell. Yeah, uh, labor that's exactly love. my line. Labor of love. I I wrote a book on uh, ASP.NET MVC once upon a time, and uh, yeah, it it was also writing for a beta framework that that hadn't been released yet, and uh, learned all kinds of things not to ever do again, like write a book in <laughs> Word 2003. Oh. Yeah, you know, some, some some publishers you get to work day. in markup, and other publishers you have to work in Word. And when I have to work in Word, I I put off conversion to Word until the last possible second. I work in plain text with you know yeah. my own markup or whatever I need. And only at the last possible second do I commit to putting in a Word because Word just slows you down so much. It does, and I also couldn't like you have the like the bold button in the in the toolbar, and you can't like the, it's disabled with their particular Word template. I wrote for Manning and Manning's mm-hmm. template at the time. They had a bunch of macros that would like stylize the text in a specific way. So yeah, it was painful. Anyway, but enough about uh, the perils of book writing. <laughs> uh, Lots of people have one book in them. You know, the, you hear that story a lot. Yeah. Lots of people do one and done. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I did two and done. And I, I don't know. I, every once in a while, I'm like, I should write another book. And I'm like, what am I talking about? I don't need I am really relieved that the two topics that I could possibly consider writing another book on are both being covered by other authors at this time. So sometime <laughs> in 2014, uh, we're going to see books on AV Foundation and HTTP live streaming, and I don't have to write them. And that's going to make me really happy. That's funny. Sweet. Speaking of to, HTTP live to streaming, we brought you on today to talk about streaming. Let's do that. I love streaming. I consume more media by streaming than anything else. Uh, you guys i mean is are there any cord cutters out there i keep trying to convince my wife i yep we watch a lot of stuff off of our dvr but Mm -hmm. i mean we could get a hulu plus subscription and effectively be in the same place right right or you know we pay a thousand or excuse me a hundred bucks a month for direct tv that's like you know three season passes a month on itunes (laughs) so you know we could go back more tv than we could watch yeah exactly my cord has been cut for four years i think five years maybe yeah, the the thing that I keep hearing from my wife is, well, the kids shows are on Disney Channel and whatever, so I want to keep those because then I can just turn on the TV. Actually, Netflix is like a treasure trove of kids entertainment. Yeah, and we've done that before. It may not be well, Disney, but uh, you'll well, find lots of stuff. And it automatically just plays the next episode for like two hours before it finally goes, are you still there? <laughs> anyway, so I actually know the people who wrote the... I think it's the ABC app. It might be the CBS. I forget. It's one of those three-letter TV station apps. And uh, he did a whole bunch with HTTP live streaming. But this was a few years ago when I last talked to him. Is it pretty easy? The thing about HTTP live streaming, honestly, is for the iOS developer, uh, the client side of this is by far the easiest piece. But consider them saying that there's there's pieces at all this is a very interdisciplinary a very holistic kind of effort uh to to stage this stuff you've got to have expertise in networking uh, on the server side on the client side of course for your ios client possibly other kinds of clients because http live streaming works on a whole bunch of stuff because it's been so successful on ios we'll talk about that in a bit i'm sure you've got a, a master encoding you know you've got to understand video encoding you've got to understand multiple bit rates different you know d- delivery to people who have great connections people who have spotty connections and one of the most interesting things about http live streaming is people whose connection quality is going to vary during the stream itself so um yeah on the client side 
it can be as easy as just going to uh, MP Movie Player Controller or uh, AV Player and just throwing this magical URL at it uh, that will end in .m3u8. But what's going on behind the scenes of that and what gets the video or, or the audio to the uh, the recipient is uh, actually a pretty fascinating process. But before we get into that, though, I'm a little curious. Are there other methods of streaming for iOS other than <clears throat> HTTP live streaming? For? For video? Or for audio? For audio, I'm going to put a caveat on this because, yes, for audio, you could do something like uh, the old-fashioned uh, shoutcast-style streaming, which is um, basically you're taking an MP3 file or an AAC, you're dribbling it out over an HTTP connection, and the server uh, is responsible for giving that file out only at about the rate it's being played back, plus a little extra for buffering and metadata. And that's really the classic kind of way of seeing streaming is that the, the server is responsible for controlling the connection and giving out the, uh, the media at just the right speed for it to be consumed. So that does exist uh, on iOS and is possible. For video, you more or less have to do HTTP live streaming for a number of reasons. A, the fact that it's just so deeply supported, you know, within the OS. And if you had some other scheme, you would have to bring the code to depacketize it and to decode it and get those frames up on the screen and, and keep it in sync with the audio. So you'd be doing a lot of work. Uh, you'd probably be doing most or all of it on the CPU and not getting any GPU benefit. But really to top it off, the big killer is the fact that one of the many app store guideline codicils is that if you are going to stream video for longer than 10 minutes over a cellular connection, you must use HTTP live streaming. You cannot use any other format. And moreover, there are requirements of the contents of your stream for that scenario. Uh, the most significant of which is that in HTTP live streaming, as we'll talk about in a bit, you have the ability to provide different variant bit rates. And if you go Apple's route, you have to supply one at 64 kilobit a second that is audio only. So someone who has a real crap connection can fall down to that rather than just getting a buffering spinner. So um, because of those you know, things taken together, how much Apple gives you and the fact that they more or less put a gun to your head and say you're going to use HLS if you're doing video unless you're going to go Wi-Fi only, that you know, realistically everyone picks it. And it, that's had the effect of making people outside the Apple sphere uh, go to HTTP live streaming. It is supported on modern versions of Android, starting with Android 4 and going up. HTTP live streaming is supported on the Roku box. It is supported but not preferred on the Xbox. So by and large, set-top boxes and mobile devices are going to work with HTTP live streaming as is. So if you are encoding and serving that to your iOS users, you're going to get these other devices for free. So while there are some other formats, there is Microsoft Smooth Streaming, and that's the preferred one for Xbox. There's uh, HTTP, excuse me, uh, Adobe Dynamic Streaming, and now there's uh, an attempt to create a new standard called MPEG Dash. Right now, the reality on the ground is you solve a lot of problems by going HLS for your mobile devices and set tops and um, just embedded flash for your desktops. So is there a reason this isn't supported? There isn't browser support for HLS or is there browser support? Oh, there's perfectly good browser support as long as you're on a Mac running Safari. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know... (laughs) So, so yeah, otherwise, ways. you can you can have any browser you like as long as it's Safari. Yes, yeah, so that's a problem, and um, it gets us into a lot of issues. The the, the fact that uh, HTTP live streaming, while the spec doesn't call for any specific codec to be used, in reality, the only thing that's being used is H two sixty four. Well, uh-huh. that of course in in the Firefox world gets us into you know the, the political correctness of they would rather have a a patent unencumbered codec. They would prefer that we use something like VP eight and WebM. And that figures actually into the, the new standard MPEG dash. Its spec says that you should support both 264 and WebM in their framework. And that's all well and good, but we're fighting over whether we can get that to any level of useful acceptance. And the here and now, it, 264 is what people use. And so that's not going to be supported by Mozilla. And so there goes about half your browsers right there. Plus, and, you know, the other, the next most popular browser is Chrome and Where Google stands on 264 is actually rather interesting because while they have added it to Android because they really cannot afford to be left behind on video even more than they already have, the Chromecast 
surprisingly, does not support HLS. The Chromecast, uh, from what I've read about, I don't think the SDK is out yet. The Chromecast uses uh, MPEG Dash and Microsoft Smooth Streaming. So of all the portable and embedded and set-top devices, the Chromecast has decided to make itself an odd man out by not supporting HLS. Interesting. That's really interesting. So you could, in theory, use a different codec for HLS, but in practice, people don't do that. Right. And that gets back to the nature of what HTTP live streaming is. And I suppose we should you know, take a couple minutes to <laughs> examine how that even works. Uh, if you think of the old style of streaming, if you were around and say, you know, the, the 90s, the early 10, 2000s, when websites would beg us to download Real Player and Windows Media Player and QuickTime uh, Streaming Player, all of them used uh, the methodology of, well, when you think of if I need to get something from a server somewhere at a low level, what do I do? I open a socket, I start receiving bytes. Well, the nature of streaming is different. If you think of, you know, the simple way to get media to a recipient would be, okay, I've got a flat file of media. I'm going to open that socket. I'm going to move that data as fast as I can, and then I'm going to close the connection. That's fine for flat files that can then be stored and played on that device. But the nature of streaming is that the way in which we consume that media figures into its transmission in some form. Uh, and in particular, what, what I mean by that is that we are going to send the data out at about the rate it's being uh, received. Or if the user wants to jump halfway into it, well, we don't want to have to make them wait for the first half of the file. We want to be able to just jump ahead to that point. So the old forms of streaming, the server was responsible for doing all that work. And of course, that becomes a scaling problem. Um, it becomes very difficult if you have thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of viewers that you have each one of them is going to have a connection that has to be managed by a server. And the server has to be aware of this client is getting this data this fast or getting this part of the media. You know, you may even be applying some form of encryption or something. It gets to be very expensive and very difficult. So what HTTP live streaming does and all the other HTTP based streaming platforms do the same thing. So this is also true of adaptive streaming, smooth streaming and dash is they move all the smarts to the client. So the client is responsible for knowing what it wants and how fast it can receive data. Being yeah, a other, client developer, wait a minute. Hmm? I have to do all the hard part on the server. It's going to be, it's going to be fine because at least on iOS, the libraries and the frameworks do all that work for you. Okay. You open a URL and you never notice the difference. Oh, good. Um, so what happens is in the new way of doing things, we'll take a source media file. You know, let's say we got a two hour movie. And we break it up into 10 second segments. And then we put those 10 second segments on a web server and we create a playlist file. Honest to God, it is a Winamp playlist from 1997. More or less kidding. the same. <laughs> no. It kicks M3, the llama's ass. The M3 U8 file is an old fashioned winamp.pls file with a couple little protocol adaptations over the years. The, you know, as happens most of the time, We've had to bastardize the comment syntax and make that actually into, well, it's a comment unless it starts with any of the following strings, in which case it's actually metadata for the stream. So, you know, when you actually look at these playlist files, you look at like, you know, there's little pound signs at the beginning of the line. It's like, oh, well, here's the beginning of a segment. So the playlist indicates here's the first 10 seconds of the file, and it has a relative reference to one of those little segment files that we split our original into. And they are MPEG-2 transport stream files. They are .ts's. And so when your client gets this playlist, says, oh, okay, well, I'm going to start the first part of the broadcast. I'm going to pull down that first 10-second segment. And I'll get the second one. And then if the user wants to jump way ahead, well, I can, I've basically got a, a, a mapping here of contents, you know, time to which file I need. I can just jump ahead and start pulling that one down. Now, that's one of the three major tricks of HTTP live streaming. Now, the second is called variant playlists, and that solves our bitrate problem. So what happens is I may have a playlist of playlists, and in that case, each of the other playlists is going to be tied to some specific bitrate. So I'm going to say, okay, well, I'm going to have one where the media goes out about, say, 200 kilobits a second. Maybe I'll have one that's about... 800 or a meg and a half, or for people who have really nice connections, you know, they're going to watch in Heidi, they're going to get four megabit per second. So each of those will have its own set of segment files. And what will happen is the client will try to retrieve the first segment of a default playlist. And then it'll say to itself, Hey self, how fast did I get this file? Assuming it's say 10 seconds. 
if it took me seven or eight seconds, I can live with that, but I may look to drop down to a slower bit rate to ensure that I don't fall behind or buffer. And of course, if it took me longer than 10 seconds. I'm like, okay, I'm definitely, you know, at too high of a bit rate. I have to go to a lower bit rate. Versus on the other hand, if I got it in about a second or less than a second, it's like, you know what? I'm going to try to get that next bit rate up and I'll give the viewer a better experience. So by and large, these codecs or these, these, um, the, the, the streaming standards, they don't pause and do the buffer spinning a lot. What happens instead is as network conditions degrade, video quality just degrades because it quietly just drops to a different variant. And as long as all those segments across the different bit rates and across their, their respective playlists, as long as they line up perfectly in terms of time, then the client library can switch between the different bit rates seamlessly. And the only way you'd know it would happen is just that your video quality either degrades or improves. That makes sense. Is there some way of it knowing that, or does it just handle all that automatically on the client end? There is no way that your software on iOS or Mac can know the bit rate it's getting, at least not that I'm aware of. If there is Actually, I think, I think there's a way you can get it. I was talking to the Apple engineers about this, uh, to solve kind of a tricky problem of, of, um, having lots and lots of these playlist files. Uh, mm-hmm. one of the issues, uh, with that is, for instance, if I have lots of music files and I want to assemble them in a custom order for you and a different order for somebody else, mm-hmm. uh, I would, uh, perhaps need to have an individual playlist per song, maybe. And they were just spitballing these ideas with me. Uh, one of the issues with that is that it won't carry over the bit rate from one playlist to another. And, uh, so, uh, the guy, the guy, I forget his name, the guy who worked on the HLS spec, uh, he said, what you can do is inspect the log. Uh, there's a live streaming, uh, log that you can look at. And inside of there, it will tell you what bit rate you're getting. And then okay. what you would end up doing is having another variant of playlist that favors that bit rate first. So if you have like high and low quality, and you were getting high quality last time, then you might start with the playlist that favors high quality for the next right, right. available because when, set of audio. It seemed like a huge hack, but he did mention specifically that you can inspect the log. So I haven't actually done this. Uh, I was just you know, trying to figure out if HLS was going to work for that particular application. Certainly sounds like a feature request for bugreport.apple.com, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when, when, when the, uh, when, so when the you... option is scraping a text file or a log file that's being written, <laughs> yikes. <laughs> Yeah, I don't even think it's a, a file. I think you have to like go grab a string from somewhere. <laughs> it's like a rolling buffer in memory or something. Anyway, could you explain like so I I have a bunch of videos that I I record every week and I I cross encode them to uh, you know WebM and and Aquorbis and H264 and it's easy enough right now with HTML uh HTML5 to pointed at the appropriate file for the browser you're on, and it generally works as long as you have a good connection. Uh, and on iOS, I can do the same thing as long as you have a good connection. Like The progressive download of an MP4 file works pretty well. Could you explain like what the specific advantages are? I, I see that there's an advantage on like bitrate switching, but if you're just dealing with one file and you're not actually continuously appending audio to a bucket, in a scenario like live video, of course, you'd be like, you'd keep dumping content into a bucket and clients would continue to read from that. But if you had just have static files, you know, is there still a benefit of doing HLS over just progressive download? One that would come to mind, you point out live, which of course is, 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 is a huge one, but also if the device that you were sending it to did not have enough storage to receive a file. Now you're talking about sending, you know, small, if you're sending audio files, you know, generally, you know, we're walking around with 64 gig devices. We're not going to be really worried about that. But, you know, when I hear that, you know, Netflix is talking about considering streaming 4K movies, uh, a 4K movie is about 50 gigabytes. So there's not a lot of set top boxes that could receive and store that as a file. So it starts to be very nice to, you know, when you're only going to consume that video or audio once and then forget about it, you know, not having to store it gives you the ability to start thinking about, you know, cheaper devices that don't have storage. And, you know, that's really what we right. saw with the, the evolution of the Apple TV in, you know, changing from a box that had a spinning disc to a box that has very little storage on it at all because it can just stream everything. Well, the other thing is, is even the, the high resolution movies that, you know, I download off of iTunes, you know, those are four or five gig and my wife's iPad has a gazillion and a half pictures on it. And so she really can't put movies on there. 
And so, you know, in, in that case too, it's, it's storage constrained, even though she does have room technically for the, the file that's being pulled down. Isn't there also a case where doing HLS, I'm guessing here, but it feels like it would make it easier for this, from the server point of view because you've just got small static files that you can put onto, onto a CDN r- rather than this kind of huge 4 gig file that you've got to ship around all over the place. Yeah, and CDN is a huge factor in terms of why HLS has taken off. You know, if you think of, I remember that first time a couple of years ago when Apple said they were going to start live streaming their, their product events again or the, the dub dub keynote. Uh, when they first announced they were going to do that, everyone's like, Oh my God, the internet is going to die because we're going to have a million people all hitting the same server at Moscone or Yerba Buena or Santa Clara or wherever it was. And the backbone will just completely die. And of course, that's not what happens at all because the nature of the, the the streaming is that you know when we produce those files and in the case of of a live stream you know, you're just basically writing the segments one after another and you have a playlist that will just continually update itself and the clients know to refresh that playlist but once you create those segment files they're pushed out to the edge servers on something like akamai or edgecast or whatever so all the request traffic doesn't hit the internet backbone it doesn't go all the way to california it hits your closest edge server so that makes this extremely appealing in terms of scaling because now we're not killing the server like we used to with the old style formats and we're not killing the bandwidth by everybody going to the same server or the same cluster of servers. Now we can really farm it out nicely. And you can use all of the nice HTTP caching semantics to, to put something really simple in front of your origin server like Varnish or Squid or, or Nginx or whatever and then you don't have like a even even inside of your data center you don't have a single server that's having to or a single cluster of servers that's having to kind of handle all of this load you can just put something really dumb and cheap and commodity in front of that server and and you're you're done in terms of load on your origin server yeah and and in fact you yeah. know when i've done a talk at uh, cococonf and my local coco heads about actually about http live streaming you know i've got a demo app all the source video streams for that are actually stored in a folder on Dropbox. You know, I do not have a dedicated server for it at all. You can use something as dumb as Dropbox. Any Apache server will work. So that leads me to a question, and that is that on the server end, then, can you basically just have a set of static files that are just playlist files and actual content files? Yep, that is totally how it works. So you could stream it, you know, off your own Mac by just turning on your Apache. And, and writing the files into your uh, your web documents. Could you use S3 buckets for that as well? Absolutely. In fact, that's mostly what uh, a lot of large providers do. Yeah. And uh, to get into the case where we get a little more fancy with things, sort of a, a fairly ideal way to set this up if you want to support both iOS clients and then also support web browsers and Flash is what a lot of people will use is a, a program called Wowza. And what Wowza does is Wowza runs on a server, you send it a broadcast from some source, generally use a tool we can discuss later called uh, Telestream Wirecast, but you send it a stream in Adobe RTMP format, Wowza will re-encode if it needs to go to different you know bit rates of, of 264 and can also transmux it so it goes out as HLS, it also goes out as Flash, any other things you need to support. And Really, the default way of of setting up Wowza is to put it on uh, Amazon EC2 and then use Amazon's edge server network. So basically, you know, Wowza partners with Amazon, uh, and I went to a couple presentations of theirs at a trade show a few weeks ago. It, they offer it as an all-in-one solution because it then at that point becomes very easy to just from one place, you know, from Amazon and and build to Wowza, run that instance on EC2, you get your content delivery network from Amazon, and then you're broadcasting from your basement around the world. You'll scale up and down really nicely. And then all you have to do is figure out a way to pay for all the bandwidth you're consuming because you will get killed on that. <laughs> yeah, that is uh, not to be discounted. I I uh, have all my videos hosted on S3, and I recently complained uh, sort of half-heartedly that, uh, that the CloudFront, is, their CDN is really expensive. Uh, and yeah. It's not necessarily that that's expensive per se, because uh, I haven't shopped it around with other CDNs. I assume that that's actually uh, one of the cheaper options, but it increased my S3 bill by almost a hundred dollars a month uh, just by turning on the CDN. But uh, yeah. but that allows friends of NS Screencast to 
uh, listen or stream the videos from Australia or from, you know, Bangladesh or wherever. I mean, somebody posted a screenshot once and they were getting like 1K per second on a download from <sighs> iTunes. <laughs> That's kind of unacceptable, you know, around the world. So not everybody as, lives near Virginia. As I priced it out, you sort of have to figure, and this is really a big deal, like you said, for video, your bandwidth costs are probably going to be somewhere in the order of about 10% or 10 cents per viewer hour because with nice looking video, a viewer will consume about a gigabyte an hour. So if you're, you know, broadcasting to a hundred friends, you know, it's going to cost you 10 bucks. Um, if you're broadcasting to a thousand, you need to start thinking, can I get these people to click on my affiliate links or can I show them an ad or, you know, how am I going to pay for the bandwidth for this? Yeah. I mean, in my case, this is a subscription service. So they're already paying me. Uh, and, right. Uh, so having something like that would actually be helpful, you know, 10 cents per viewer per hour, uh, to, to help calculate that. Now, I just described the, you know, the very manual way to do it, which is something, you know, I'm setting up for, for my own streaming to do next year. A much more simplified way to do that, to get your fingers, uh, dirty and just get your feet wet would be to go with a service called, you know, like, uh, Ustream, Livestream, Twitch, or Justin. Uh, all of them have sort of canned all in one solutions that you can, uh, play with. And they will do all that transcoding for you. They, they may well be running Wowza and EC2 and CloudFront in the background, but that would give you a way that you can get your stuff out there to the iOS devices and to the desktops. And if what interests you is the producer side of the equation, then that's a great way to go. That They will take care of HLS and everything else for you. I use a Zencoder to do all the encoding. And I used to just do this on my, you know, my iMac at home, I queue up a job, but you know, it makes the thing get really hot and it takes like half an hour or something because the jobs run sequentially. And anyway, uh, with Zencoder, I just put it in a bucket, the Zencoder reads and kick off a job and it spits them out in parallel and the whole thing's done in about 10 minutes. And uh, they offer HLS outputs as well. So uh, so I believe that's just a, a few settings that I would have to tweak to have it output into that, into that format, which is nice. Right. And of course, you know, since they're not, you know, um, I was gonna say another option would be you could go with like compressor on, on Mac and, you know, that's very Apple scriptable. So you can throw a bunch of work at compressor. It does have HLS presets, but what compressor won't do for you is give you a bunch of, you know, the, the formats that Apple doesn't necessarily like, you know, compressor is not going right. to give you WebM. Whereas a third party like Zencoder is going to let you support those if that's what you need for your particular audience. You know, honestly, I hate WebM. It's, you know, from a, a content producer standpoint, it takes longer to encode. The file sizes are bigger and the content, like the vid actual quality is like visibly worse. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know, aside from like the patent unencumberedness of it, I don't know what, why somebody would choose it. I think you forgot the term supposed patent and unencumberedness. Um, <laughs> that remains. Okay. So question. there's all the reasons I wish, you know, like can people just stop using Firefox and uh, then I won't have to encode in WebM. We are going to be fighting this for years. You know, we've, we've been going through codec wars for, for 20 years and they will keep going. H264, I think is the closest to a standard we've ever gotten. But, you know, as, as that starts to move to H265, there's going to be a window for someone else to squeeze in there. We have patent problems with H265 already. People, some of the companies that own the patents going into H265 are refusing to license them to the, because what happens with the MPEG patent or the MPEG standards usually is that there will be this separate body, MPEG LA, MPEG licensing authority. They will put out a call for any companies, any parties that have patents being used in the standard bring them to us. We're going to charge, you know, we'll be a one-stop shop for licensing so people can implement this in their products and then you will get paid. And every time there are holdouts. So right now, uh, Qualcomm and Samsung, last I saw, were holding out on patents for H265. That could slow 265 adoption. So maybe if there's that next thing beyond VP8 and WebM, uh, I'm sure Google's working very hard on this. If 265 is not adopted uh, quickly, there could be an opening for another codec to come in here. And, you know, again, because it's uh, Google and Firefox, it may have the blessings of political correctness within the open source community. Uh, this is a battle that just never ends. And you've just got to stay on your toes and certain devices will support certain things. But, you know, eventually it just becomes a problem that you throw money at. The fact that we have things like Zencoder and Wowza are like, you know what? Here's a bunch of money. This is your problem. Encode it in two formats. Encode it in four formats. Encode it in 
God knows however many formats I'm going to have to support to handle all the devices that I want my stuff to run on. Right, so then they do all the heavy lifting and they've already licensed all the whatever, whatever with MPEG LA and whoever else. Right. You you don't even have to worry about it. And suppose uh, WebM has no I license. I think there's fees. still no some... Balance. We'll see. Yeah, I think there's still some some issues you might have to worry about. If if I had like 10 million subscribers, then from people that I've talked to, then it seems like that right, they're... Right, the licensing um, changes. Yes. The, the, licensing well, like as a producer that you would need to uh, start uh, paying. I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. But he's right about that. MPEX licensing says, you know, they're, you know, if you're, if you're an encoder, you are always going to pay us. If you are a decoder, you may be paying us. If you are a content producer, you're not paying us until you're over a certain size. I, I believe like, like you said, is about a million. And uh, that's so that, you know, they can get, they're, they're not going to come after little webcasters like us, but on the other hand, if you build a business like DirecTV on top of H.264, if you build the Blu-ray format on top of 264, you, you've got enough money to pay them and they would like some money. So there is so much money involved in this. It is always going to be ugly. It always has been. It always will be. So I, I want to kind of change tactics a little bit. You've mentioned that the client libraries handle most of the HTTP streaming issues. And on the server, it can be as simple as just having those playlist files. Are there any parts of this that get tricky, maybe authentication or <coughs> encrypting or anything like that, or does it just handle all that too? No, uh, encryption is a really interesting thing, and that's probably where you have to do the most work on iOS. Uh huh. And that's because HLS has something really interesting for encryption, which you would think, you know, hey, if I want to encrypt my video, I'm just going to run HTTPS, right? That's a simple solution, but that doesn't scale. That's when I get hit by a million viewers who are going at one gigabit a second. That is quite a lot of, of data to be running through SSH. So what I have to do instead is in HLS, you encrypt your video first, a one-time encryption. So you go from these .ts files that you actually could play in QuickTime Player to just random garbage. And you have very small key files, really only like, you know, 16, 32 bytes because they're done with AES. I think you guys were talking, um, AES and security on the last show. So you have these tiny little key files that will decrypt the big encrypted segment files that you encrypt once and host on your server. Where that becomes a little bit tricky is you have to do a little bit of a song and dance on the iOS or Mac side with the uh, NSURL credential store. And, you know, you have to have a, a, some scheme by which if you're going to have those keys and you're going to deliver them to the clients, well, you're going to have to figure out how to do so in a secure way. They're going to have to authenticate with you somehow. You'll send them over some kind of secure channel. And then you'll have to use the NSURL credential store to more or less tell the MP movie player controller or the AV player how it can get to those keys when it needs to. And then it will get those keys and be able to decrypt the segments that it gets. So there's a little bit of a song and dance on the security side of it uh, if you need to do that. So if you're just looking at doing encryption to kind of protect people from kind of snooping on your video uh, over the wire, which kind of seems a bit of a weird thing to do anyway. But anyway, uh, <laughs> could you could you just serve up those AES keys over an HTTPS connection? Yeah, that's, that's what I do in my demo is, you know, I've just got them in HTTP basic authentication realm. So you can just use a browser password to get at it. And then that's the, the, the username and password supplied for that is what you would put in the, um, NSURL credential store. So you can, you can make it fairly simple. There are more elaborate ways to do it. There is an Apple page on HTTP live streaming resources that talks about some of your options for securing your stream. That's developerapple.com slash streaming. So you can look there, but. The, the simple way, you know, for people operating at our level is pretty good. And this is just for encrypting a video. It's not for di digital rights management. So is there something out there for if you want to do DRM? There's nothing in either the HTTP live streaming standard or in Apple frameworks that really addresses DRM per se. You know, that that's sort of up to you. And, and again, we get to the classic problems of DRM where, you know, you're using encryption yeah, because your intended recipient is also your attacker. Yep. You know, eventually <laughs> it's not going to hold up. But yeah, I'm. Yeah, we could get into a philosophical discussion about DRM, but maybe I will. <laughs> but you, me, and half the internet, I think. Yeah, yeah. patents and DRM. Wow, we're we're really uh, getting into it today. Yep. Are there any other tricks or things that we need to talk about for completeness on this? Any gotchas? Well, 
to me, I would say there's the fact that this isn't just a technical topic, that this exists within the whole realm of what's happening to video. This is, uh, something where if you're, if you're involved with this stuff at all, you're going to be probably part of some sort of a business effort that's built around this stuff. And then that's going to get into the, the questions of, you know, are the way we consume media is moving to IP based formats. Uh, like I said, I was just at this conference a few weeks ago, streaming media West, and it was attended by a lot of the people from the existing industries of film and television. And they said straight up our job for the next 10 years is to ensure a quote orderly transition to IP based media. So when we get involved with this, we are going to be dealing with entrenched interests and they do not want a bunch of upstarts from Northern California. And, you know, there's definitely a Southern California, Northern California rivalry here. They don't want the Googles and the Apples goring their ox the way they did with music. They are scared to hell of what could happen. <laughs> and they're right to be scared as hell because I realize in my own life, I could easily cut the cord. My wife is the only one watching traditional television. Practically everything I watch now is streamed. But moreover, I'm, you know, sometimes I'm watching people on Twitch TV play video games instead of watching regular television. I'm watching my friends host streams from their apartments where, you know, they show Japanese cartoons and make fun of them. I'm watching a lot of things that are not traditional television or movies. And the more people that are able to do this and scratch little itches that, you know, couldn't be addressed in a mass media form, but can be addressed by a very small scale streaming. And the fact that it's pretty easy to get into this stuff now, I think is going to have an effect on what we see in the future. I have kids age 11 and 8 who don't watch traditional television at all. Everything they watch is on their iPads. And streaming is changing what we expect from video. We come into it thinking in terms of television and half hour shows and, and live sporting events, but it's really moving around to a world where someone says on Twitter, Hey, I'm going to play this popular game on my, my, my Twitch TV channel in five minutes. Everybody hop on the IRC and we can start chatting. That's a really different media experience. And it's really cool that, you know, because iOS is so popular, we want to be at the forefront of that. And, and our standard is kind of winning right now. So we get to, tune into all this stuff and watch and play. Awesome. All right. Well, I know that some people have some time constraints here, so we're going to start wrapping up and move to the picks. So, Ben, do you want to start us off with picks? Uh, sure. In continuing in my uh, get back into guitar tradition, I've been uh, playing a lot of Pink Floyd uh, or learning to play a lot of Pink Floyd. And David Gilmore being my favorite guitarist ever, uh, there is a fan site called gilmoreish.com, which is just loaded with all kinds of good info and articles about uh, his gear and how he plays and how do you get the perfect tone and uh, there's backing tracks there so if you want to get like comfortably numb but without the front end guitar you can get that so you can play on top of it and that's like my favorite thing to do lately and as part of that uh, there was a review so that's my first pick is gilmorris.com uh, part of that there was a review for a, um, a big muff pedal clone that uh, uh, modeled after what david gilmore used in the 70s uh, it's kind of sort of side story uh these pedals are somewhat rare uh, in that nobody uses germanium to make pedals anymore uh, because the, uh, I think it's like with the yield, like it's hard to make it economic or whatever. Uh, and so you have to find like an old pedal from the seventies and some of them are broken and whatever. So a lot of the clones have been coming up. Uh, I just ordered a pig hoof from electric orange. I think this is in the Czech Republic. Uh, what is the CZ top level domain? Is that Czech? Yeah, it's Czech. Anybody Republic. know? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, this company's in Czech Republic. Uh, the waiting time is ten months, so <laughs> I'll have to tell you how it is. But uh, I, that somewhat gave it a, a sort of vote of confidence that the wait time is that long. And uh, so, anyway, I will let you know in ten months uh, if that was worth it or not. And uh, for my last pick, I'll do a beer pick. St. Arnold's, a local Houston brewery, uh, they do a uh, sailing Santa which is uh, half Christmas ale and half uh, St. Arnold Alyssa IPA. Uh, so it's a little nutmeggy, but plenty of bitter hops as well. So it's pretty good. Cool. James, what are your picks? Okay, if I would have gone first, I probably would have stolen Ben's pick because he was tweeting about this over the weekend. <laughs> so I sat down and read about all the different 
tones David Gilmore did. Like, did you know David Gilmore played a Telecaster on Animals? I didn't know, but now I know. So that's pretty cool stuff. <laughs> you knew? Okay. But I, I do have one warning, though. If you're trying to play the comfortably numb solo towards the end, don't have 11 gauge strings unless your fingers are really ready for it. He does a couple bends that are like three frets. And I really hurt my hand this weekend trying to play that again. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, think, I think I got some monster calluses going now. So I'm ready to try it again. But uh, some, uh, some picks. So I've got some kind of winter picks because it's cold here and I have to go out and shovel some snow for the third time in three days. But when you're done shoveling snow, it's nice to maybe have a beverage. So a couple of beverages I like after shoveling snow. The New Belgium, the guys who make Fat Tire, they've got a really good winter beer. They call it an IPA. It doesn't really feel like an IPA, but kind of a roasty stout with a little bit of hops. So the New Belgium Snow Day is a good after shoveling snow pick. Also, Scotch pick. We've done a Scotch pick, but I'll do another one. This is a pretty common, pretty common, one of the standard ones, but Lafroig. Nice peaty, Mendocini type yes. scotch, Woo-hoo! which is excellent. Excellent pick for being outside in cold weather and shoveling. Come back in if you have a fire place. It'd be nice to do that. I, I wouldn't recommend it for people that aren't really versed in scotch because it's kind of an acquired taste. But if you're kind of on the fence, definitely give it a try. That's my pick. All right. Pete, what are your picks? My first pick is an anti-pick, an anti-pick, as the Americans would say. I haven't done an anti-pick before, so this is exciting. Um, <clears throat> my anti-pick is going to be patents, patents, because uh, they're really annoying and they don't really do much good anymore in the software world, and they just cause us to spend minutes and minutes on our podcasts talking about whether we should use this or that rather than choosing things based on technical merit, and it's just a waste of everyone's time. So I don't like patents in the software world. My next pick is going to be fairly random. It's a, a company called Adafruit. So I've been really getting into um, kind of hardware and playing with Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and various other things recently. Um, Adafruit's great. It's a, they're like a they're a, a store. They're a place where you can buy kind of hardware and they'll ship it to you. But they're also um, a really good source of kind of tutorials for beginners and people like me who are likely to burn ourselves with a soldering iron rather than actually solder things. And then my last pick is a thing called the Grip Master, inspired by uh, James' comment about the calluses. Um, so this is one of those little finger exerciser things. Rock climbers like them, which is why I used to I got it when I was used to rock climb. Um, guitar players like them. I like them because they're just a really good thing to fidget with while you're thinking about things or talking to people, and I'm a, I'm a real fidgeter. I've bought about four of these in the last couple of years, and I keep on le- leaving them places. Like, I leave them in meeting rooms and then forget where I've left them and all that kind of thing. But they're, they're a great thing if you're into fidgeting, rock climbing, or playing guitar. I would put a link in the show notes to their website, but apparently their website has been hacked, and it redirects I to a website selling uh, Viagra. <laughs> Do the Amazon link right below that. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I'm going to go for is the Amazon link. So apologies uh, apologies to uh, prohands.net for your hacking. You might want to fix that. All right. I'm going to jump in with a couple of picks, and then we'll have Chris's picks. Uh, my first pick, because uh, of what Pete said, I'm going to pick soldering. I think it's a skill that everyone should have. Um, it's it's a handy skill. It's I fix crap all the time with my soldering iron. So, uh, Chuck, actually, I said soldering. Soldering? Yes. You said soldering? I said soldering. <laughs> I see. <laughs> it has an L in it. Very nice. My second pick is uh, Thai food. Uh, I'm really, I, I just love Thai food, so I thought I'd pick that too. And finally, uh, my last pick, I've been working on my website for my consulting business. I've only been freelance for like three and a half years, and I've never really had a website for my freelance business because I've been so busy working on other people's crap. But I really want something out there where people can come and see what I can do for them. And so I've been working on it. I went and picked up um, a theme for WordPress uh, since it was kind of the fastest way to get something up. I got it off of themeforest.net, which is kind of a nice place to get uh, web layouts. I think they also have some mobile layouts that you can pick up. And so uh, just some great stuff there. So I'll put a, a link in there. And let's hear Chris's picks. All right there. Well, for anybody who wants to... um 
try out streaming to begin with uh, and doing live streaming. A great place to begin is Ustream. Uh, it's Ustream.tv. You can basically set up there for free. They will insert commercials in your uh, in your stream, but not much, like about once an hour. And your your viewers on desktops will actually have an opportunity to decide in a sliding two or three minute window, I'm ready for the ad now or I want to wait and then you know click when they're ready to see it. They give you some pretty good tools to work with. For one thing, their iOS app is capable of sending a stream from the app itself. Uh, I have gone to conferences where I've seen people like holding up iPads at the front of the room thinking, what the heck is he doing? And the dude is actually live streaming the talk from the iOS Ustream app. So that's a nice place to get started. When you're using their tools on the Mac, they give you, and, and a lot of these things, Justin, Twitch, and Livestream will do two, one of two things to either, to get your video up there. Either they will just turn on your, your webcam with flash and that'll be it. Or in the case of Ustream, they give you a white label version of my second pick, which is Telestream Wirecast. And Telestream Wirecast gives you the ability to capture from your desktop, to play videos, to mix. Uh, you can do a picture in picture thing. You get a great deal of control over your, your production. And then that's all sent up to the uh, streaming provider. Like I said, in the case of Ustream, you get one that only works with Ustream. But if you go and buy Wirecast, that'll work with all the main providers. Or if you have a, uh, an Adobe streaming server, a QuickTime streaming server, just if you have your own server set up, you can use Wirecast and send to that. And Wirecast will also work with the Wowza media encoder that I described earlier. So a pretty complete solution would be use Wirecast on your desktop to produce and create your live stream, send that to Wowza to transcode and transmux, and then you'll hit all devices everywhere. And most people I know who are fairly serious about this, I've talked with some people who do live streams in the, the anime DVD industry. They do their event live streams all with Wirecast, all with Wowza. So at a certain level of a professionalism, and that's where you would just want to go. And it's a uh, wirecast about 500 bucks, but Telestream usually has a big sale twice a year. One's Black Friday and one is sometime around Christmas where they'll knock 30% off and 30% off 500 bucks is a pretty big deal. Third pick, just want to mention because we were talking about cord cutting. My third pick is Crunchyroll, which is a service that sends um, uh, Japanese cartoons and Korean drama around the world. So if you're a big fan of anime like I am, this is most of what I watch nowadays is I just, Watch it on my iPad, my Roku, Apple TV. They have incredible device support. And they're kind of interesting because they have acquired the rights to uh, video that they're able to show in a lot of different countries and turn material around so quickly that they've thwarted piracy. And they've solved a lot of problems that nobody else in the video industry has done. And they're kind of a, a model for what we're going to see of Internet video going forward. And finally, because you guys made me thirsty with all your talk about IPAs, uh, I've got to kick in here from my uh, hometown of uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Beer Town, USA, Founders Centennial IPA. Founders is uh, a, a brewery here in Grand Rapids. Very interesting story. They were started up by some guys who nearly ran out of money. They called uh, one of their recent beers is called Bolt Cutter because they thought they were going to get chained down by the bank. And so they bought a bolt cutter so they could break back into their own building and keep uh, keep brewing. <laughs> um, but they have a world-class IPA called Centennial IPA. It's not crazy bitter like a lot of APAs, but it's just got a really, really deeply satisfying taste. It's very highly rated on Beer Advocate. And we are very proud in Grand Rapids to have so many breweries and, and have such a beer culture here. Uh, people tour our city just to drink beer, which is kind of cool. That is cool. awesome. I just I had a, a, a founder's breakfast out the other day, and that was awesome. Ooh. This is the first time anyone's made a beer pick that I, actually, I can actually get here in Minnesota. So thank you. <laughs> Founders is available about half of the United States. So it's you know, definitely in the Midwest. It's starting to head west. It's in New England. So the south and the west are where we need to conquer next. Oh, I don't drink alcohol. And it's kind of funny when you guys pick this stuff. I'm like, oh, that sounds nice. Anyway. Well, thanks for coming, Chris. We really appreciate you taking the time and uh, all of your expertise. If people need to get a hold of you or want to ask more questions, what's the best way to do that? Probably hop on Twitter. I'm invalid name. Uh, I'll offer the proviso that basically I talk about iOS by daytime and anime by night. So you may want to set up a script to follow and unfollow me if there's one of those topics you're not particularly interested in. <laughs> uh, I also blog at subfurther.com slash blog. Uh, and new updates I just post to Twitter and app.net. So you know, look for me there. Awesome. 
All right. And I'll also be at the, all the various Coco Confs next year. And I'm also speaking at CodeMash, but at CodeMash, I'm actually doing a, a class on how to program the Roku, uh, which is a completely different streaming device. Hey, I'm going to be at CodeMash too. Come to my class. It's on Wednesday. Okay. You come to my talk. It's on another day that I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. <laughs> all right. We'll catch you all next week. Thanks.